Have you ever heard of Kuwait? If not, you're about to, because they're working on a huge and incredibly smart project. They're building an entire seaside city right in the middle of a desert where temperatures can reach 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Instead of reclaiming land from the sea like the Palm Islands in Dubai, they're doing the opposite, bringing the sea inland. Kuwait is the first country to ever attempt this. In the process, they're doubling the length of Kuwait's coastline. Over 170 million cubic yards of sand, enough to build 20 pyramids, have been excavated. This is a $5 billion project. Every house will have its own private beach, and people will live in the cleanest city in the Middle East. But is it really possible to turn a desert into an oasis? And even if it works, will anyone actually want to live there? Leave a comment with your thoughts before you hear the rest of this story. Kuwait is the smallest country in the Arabian desert, yet it boasts one of the world's top 10 highest gross domestic products per capita. Yes, oil has propelled this nation forward in just a few decades, bringing about soaring skyscrapers and a rapidly growing middle class. But at the same time, it has made the country heavily dependent on black gold. And as the oil fields gradually decline, the question arises, what will happen next? However, urban development in Kuwait isn't easy. Over 70% of its territory is barren desert, where summer temperatures soar above 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Scorching winds whip up sand like razors, and fresh water is more precious than gold. Every construction project must battle nature from the very foundation, no trees, no shade, no water. Truly, Kuwait's interior is not meant for life. All 4.2 million people have to squeeze along a narrow 100-mile stretch of coastline, where most of the land is already taken up by ports' military bases and old residential areas. They can't live in the desert, nor can they expand into the sea. Then, in the midst of closed-door meetings between engineers and planners, a bold question was raised. If we can't go out to the sea, why not let the sea flow in? instead of dredging sand into the sea like Dubai or Qatar. The engineering team proposed a completely different plan dig artificial tidal canals deep into the land, creating a network of lagoons, man-made islands, and small bays all with real flowing water rising and falling with the natural tides. This is a living hydrological model mimicking the way the ocean breathes. Geologically, the idea actually makes a lot of sense. Kuwait's seabed is shallow with soft mud, so building out into the sea like Dubai would risk collapse. This approach is both safer and less damaging to the environment. The plan was handed to the United Kingdom's Halcro Group, an engineering firm that helped design the Suez Canal to develop the Middle East's first three-dimensional hydrological model, capable of accurately simulating real tidal flow with no stagnation and no need for pumps. Everything seemed ready until 1990, when Iraq suddenly invaded Kuwait. The entire country was devastated by war. It took more than a decade for Kuwait to recover. In 2003, the project was revived with a new name, Sabah al Ahmed Sea City, with a price tag of $5 billion. Many were skeptical, salty, hollow ground, weak foundations without tidal flow. This place will turn into a dead lagoon. But Kuwait was determined to make it happen. In 2004, the southernmost desert of Kuwait began to shake. The project was launched by Khalid Yusuf Al Marzouk, one of the country's wealthiest real estate developers, and was fully funded by La Ala Al Kuwait Real Estate Company under a public private partnership model. The government provided the land while the private sector took on all costs and risks. This was unprecedented in the Gulf, where mega projects like Dubai's Palm Jumeirah or the Pearl in Qatar are state controlled. From day one, over 170 million cubic yards of sand and mud had to be moved more than the initial phase of the Suez Canal. To put it in perspective, that's enough material to build 20 Giza pyramids. Thousands of workers from over 20 countries worked around the clock in temperatures of 117 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, this is the fifth hottest country in the world. 
Project Director Ian Williams shared this plan was drawn up in the 1980s, but the 1990 Gulf War buried it for over a decade. From a lifeless stretch of white sand, thousands of workers from more than 20 countries poured in. Every day they worked in temperatures that could exceed 122 degrees Fahrenheit, to the point where all construction had to pause from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. during the summer. At night, 13,000 high-powered lights lit up the site, so work could continue nonstop. About 3,000 workers labored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 29 bulldozers, 70 excavators, and 113 heavy trucks worked relentlessly dredging every yard of earth and sand. It's estimated that over 170 million cubic yards of sand were excavated enough to build 20 Giza pyramids. To build the city, the amount of asphalt used could cover 703 soccer fields, and just the fresh water supply system alone required 17 high-rise water towers. Along the canals, thousands of drought-resistant trees were planted to bring greenery to this once parched land. Sea City is divided into 10 development phases, with a total area equivalent to Manhattan, New York. Once completed, the project is expected to house 250,000 residents, along with residential areas, shopping centers, and luxury marinas for the elite. As of late 2025, the project is more than halfway done, about 7 out of 10 phases. The northern areas are already inhabited, while the southern section is expected to be finished by 2026, with the entire project fully operational by around 2030. Sounds perfect, right? A city in the desert, where every home has its own private beach, a dream elsewhere reserved only for the super rich. But remember, the entire project sits on a salty, sponge-like foundation that could collapse after just a few heavy rains. From the very beginning, engineers faced the question, how can a floating city stand firm in a sinking desert? In the first four phases, they dug over 58 million cubic yards of earth. And when finished, the total sand and mud moved will exceed 180 million cubic yards more than the initial phase of the Suez Canal. Imagine if you piled all that sand into stadiums, it could fill more than 50,000 soccer fields. Day and night fleets of dump trucks lined up spreading dumping and compacting sand to create an almost perfectly flat base. But desert sand is unlike any other soil. It's fine loose and easily shifts. To stabilize it, engineers used a special method dropping a 33,000 pound weight from 40 feet high, pounding the ground 15 times at each spot creating compression craters up to 33 feet deep. From above the site, looked like a giant waffle, each square a human fingerprint etched into the desert. To protect the city, they built a massive breakwater made of 28,000 hexagonal concrete blocks cast on site, resembling giant honeycombs linked together. And the most amazing part, Sea City doesn't need pumps. Instead, 22,000 pound automatic tidal gates open and close with the tides allowing 7.1 million gallons of seawater to flow through every minute, keeping the whole system self-cleaning and alive. Project director Ian Williams once said, Sea City is biologically sustainable because we're not just building houses, we're recreating an ecosystem lost for thousands of years. And indeed, it's not just a city, but the largest ecological experiment in the Middle East. The first challenge was water. How do you keep these artificial canals from turning into stagnant salt ponds in the desert? Instead of building massive pumping stations, the engineers chose to mimic nature. They used three-dimensional hydrodynamic modeling to simulate every tidal current, where the water would go, how fast, and how long before it changed direction. Based on that, they adjusted every tidal gate and canal bend so water could flow naturally, no electricity, no machinery needed. The entire system runs 100% passively powered only by the sea's pressure. The 22,000 pound tidal gates open automatically, 
when the tide rises and close as it falls. Gaps in the breakwater allow marine life to swim in and heavily eroded areas have extra outlets to let tides self-balance. Along the shores, thousands of mangroves and salt-tolerant trees were planted to anchor the soil shelter, migratory birds, and cool the climate. Sand was washed four times in eight separate plants, turning the raw yellow desert into white sand, as pristine as the Caribbean. Compared to Dubai, where people dump sand into the sea to create new land, Kuwait chose to bring the sea into the land to restore nature. Two completely opposite approaches. After two decades of digging, compacting, and channeling every drop of water into the desert, Sabah al Ahmad Sea City has become a paradise in the sand. From above, the scene looks like the Venice of the Middle East emerald canals, winding between luxury villas and sunlit piers. Sea City now has four marinas with over 2,700 berths where hundreds of million-dollar yachts gleam in the sun. The heart of the city is a Lyran Mall, a waterfront shopping center opened in 2023 at a cost of $820 million, where Kuwait's wealthy don't drive to shop, they sail. The mall's own marina can dock 900 yachts, making it the largest in the country. Home prices here range from $700,000 to $1.6 million, and that number keeps rising. Each villa has its own private dock, private beach, and even a spot for migratory birds to stop by each season. Just five years after the first tidal flows were brought in, the sea has literally returned. The water in the artificial canals isn't stagnant. It's now richer in marine life than the nearby natural sea. From just 142 species, there are now over 1,000 living in this lagoon system. Kuwaiti researchers say they first saw dolphins straying into these desert waters and sea turtles riding the tides into the canals. Coral and seagrass have started clinging to the massive concrete blocks, turning these man-made structures into new reefs. Not just fish, but migratory birds have also come to rest, making this the largest biological oasis in Kuwait. The Kuwaiti government quickly declared Sea City a no-fishing zone, and the results were surprising. Within a few years, the canals became a natural nursery for the whole Gulf region. Young fish grow up in this safe environment, then ride the tides back out to sea replenishing fish stocks. In a place once called a dead desert, there are now waves, birdsong, and the breath of life. National media call Sea City a 21st century climate urban model, a place where engineering and ecology coexist. But ecologists call it something else, a national scale artificial experiment. Of course, we usually only see the glamorous side canal front villas yachts docked outside green mangroves in the desert. But to create this paradise in the sand, Kuwait had to displace real villages and real people. Over 400 households and fishermen from al Kiran, once an ancient coastal fishing village, were forced to move to clear the site. Many say they were relocated but have yet to receive a clear thank you from the project. The project has completed over 10,000 homes, but in reality, only a small portion are occupied. Most villas here are second homes for the wealthy weekend getaways that are only lit up a few days each month. By day, the city is full of sunlight and water, but at night, the canal-side houses are eerily dark and silent, a paradise without people. In contrast, those truly living in Sea City are migrant workers. Thousands of South Asian laborers who built these magnificent structures must live in temporary containers enduring 117-degree Fahrenheit heat and relentless sandstorms. Even within Kuwait, public opinion is divided. Some see this as a symbol of national pride proof that Kuwait can rival Dubai. Others call it soulless showmanship amid a climate crisis. On local forums, there are even complaints that the canals sometimes smell and that water circulation is poor. Environmental researchers recently recorded periodic algal blooms and temporary drops in oxygen in the smaller canals, signs that this artificial ecosystem is still very fragile. 
So from a silent stretch of white sand, Kuwait has created Sea City a paradise in the desert. It's proof that human ingenuity can revive nature, but also a reminder that every lavish dream comes with a price. Amid all this splendor, questions remain about fairness, ecology, and a sustainable future. What do you think is Sea City a miracle or just a mirage in the sand? Leave a comment to share your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you won't miss more amazing stories about our world.